Good morning to you, you who are here in Garrett Auditorium at Baptist Memphis, others throughout our hospital system, and later those of you who will be uh, joining us through Facebook. We uh, appreciate you coming and stopping for a few minutes today. Uh, today we, uh, we have another segment of our Jimmy Terry preaching series, and I just want to remind everyone that this series is named after our longtime board member of Baptist who was a minister in Clarksville. And he had a, a mantra, I guess would be a good way to put it, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And he was adamant about sharing that everywhere he went. And a lot of people picked it up and carried it forward. And we're thankful to have this opportunity to have a preaching series that honors that and honors him. Let me invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we stop and give you thanks for the blessings. Thank you for wonderful accommodations, for the privilege that we have to live in a time where we can do things in one place and share it in many others. Thank you for the people who reached our hands to help those who are hurting, and particularly in our hospitals. We ask that you would give them strength and resilience to meet the demands of caring for people who are in trouble. We praise you, Lord, for all of your provisions. Thank you that you love us to the extremes of Calvary, and you continue to reach out to us in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. Bless our time together, we ask in Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're privileged today to have Dr. Roger Duke as our guest speaker today. Roger is a longtime Baptist, Baptist Memorial person. He served in our pharmacy for a number of years, and, and, and then he went over and served as a professor in our Health Sciences University. At that time, it was called Baptist College of Health Sciences, but since it's gone to a university status, but he was a longtime servant there. He retired early so that he could write, and uh, he's written and edited a number of books and shared it, that with co-authors. He is um, a, a great guy, in addition to being a, a really good writer loves church history, loves to hear, to, to read and share the history of some of the giants of, of our faith. And uh, you may have an opportunity to, to read some of his stuff. Uh, and uh, not like I said, not only him, but some of the things that he's participated in, he's done with, with co-authors and co-editors. But he's very blessed in so many ways, most of all in his family, he has been married to his wife, Linda, for 49 years. They have three adult children and some pretty robust and rowdy grandkids. And I think that keeps us all a little younger. And I, I praise the Lord for that. But I praise him for taking the opportunity to come and share with us today. And Roger, may the Lord lead you. And we praise you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. I hope that I can uh, live up to them. I've got a 25-year pen from Baptist. I spent about seven or eight years in the pharmacy when I was in grad school and spent another 18 years at Baptist College of Health Science. I was the dreaded speech teacher. Everyone ran from me. And I had others who would say, why do I have to take a religion course? I want to study nursing. And I said, did you see the name over the door when you came in here and started work here on your degree? This is Baptist College of Health Sciences. And you can't get out of a Baptist institution unless you have to take at least one religion class. And I made them do some things that they didn't want to do. They had to learn the books of the Bible. They had to learn the Old Testament or the New Testament. 
And in my speaking classes, they had to do, hopefully, what I'm going to do now. I taught speaking, but only you can be the critique of whether I can speak or not. So it's interesting to come home again, and I feel at home again. I love this place. It's been a part of my life. It helped send me through graduate school. It supported me. And it's just been a marvelous 25 years of my life to, to have spent those, those times here. I was interested to, to study and pray and see what the Lord might lead me to do today. And I thought about the idea of, in, of invitation, of invitation. We all have and are extended times of invitation. We have wedding invitations that come to us in the spring of the year. Also, there are graduation invitations that come to us in the spring of the year, and usually these weddings and these graduations, these graduates want something. Well, I don't want anything from you today. And I, it put me in mind when Chaplain Wilson invited me today that we get special event invitations. So I'd like to share with you from the scripture five different aspects of an invitation. And this is the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest invitation that's ever been issued. I would like to tell you about Jesus initially issuing the greatest invitation, and then I'd like to tell you about Jesus' invitation to cross-bearing, then I'd like to tell you about Jesus' invitation to come and abide in Him, and then I'd like to lastly leave us with the closing invitation of the New Testament. First, Jesus in issues His greatest invitation, and listen to what He says in Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come, and when he says come, he doesn't say come to be a Baptist. He doesn't say come and join any denominational church. He doesn't come to say be baptized. He says come to me. Come to me. And his invitation is not to a place, but it's to a person. He said come to me, all you that are laden and heavy laden. Now in those times they were working, working, working like the little hamster on the wheel. Working just to make a living. Just like we are. Little hamsters on wheels just working, working, working. S using a lot of energy but where are we going? Where are we arriving? And then he says to those who are heavy laden, heavy laden. The Pharisees had put up burden of law on them that they could not keep. And Jesus said, not only have you put this burden on them, you won't even reach out with your little finger and touch it yourself. So he's coming, he's saying, come to me and I will give you rest. Beloved, if we're ever to find rest, it's going to be in Jesus and Jesus alone. Not only does he say in his invitation, come, but he says, come and take. Come and take. Now, what were they to take? They were to take his yoke upon them. Now, they lived in, a, in an agrarian society. They knew what a yoke was. That was that beam of wood that they had made to go across the shoulders of the oxen and that they could plow with it or they could pull a wagon with it. But in the parlance of the day, if a new rabbi arose, he would have a teaching, a learning and in that, 
That would become his yoke. That would become what he would want his followers to take up. So Jesus takes this image and he uses it metaphorically and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. Take my yoke, take my learning, take my, dis my discipline upon you. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Now this is the only place, and this is interesting to me, this is the only place where Jesus reveals his heart. I am meek of heart. Jesus tells us his character there, the intimate character, if you will. And you will find rest. Take my teaching on you. Take my discipleship on you. Let that be your yoke. Let that be your learning and learn of me, and I will rest you. Now, some of you are not very old. Some of you who are older, my age, will remember J. Vernon McGee. Don't remember if you remember J. Vernon or not, but J. Vernon McGee, famous Bible preacher, said, Christ will rest you. He will rest you, and he will deliver you from this burden of law that you and I have been trying to keep. The second thing I want you to see with me is Jesus' invitation to cross-bearing. Jesus' invitation to cross-bearing. Now, the first thing, the first point was to come unto him. That was a metaphor. But here, Jesus is using more of a, of a literal kind of word picture. They all lived in Palestine. They all understood the Roman occupation. They knew what it was for a cross to be seen because the Romans executed people for insurrection all the time and it became an image in their mind. And what Jesus is saying here in Luke 9, 9, 23 and 24 is take up your cross. It's an invitation to take up your cross and follow me daily. Now what he's saying is that you must die to, to yourselves daily. What do you want to do? You have to put it away. Now, it may be a little bit of hyperbole, probably not a lot, but if Jesus were here preaching today and he was calling people to discipleship, if he was inviting people to follow him, he might say, come, I invite you to come, take up your electric chair and follow me because you have to die. That is our calling. Come to Jesus and die. And beloved, if you're not willing to die, just go on about your business. That's the essence of the Christian life. Now, there are some invitation stipulations when he talks about taking up your cross. Listen to them. In, nine, in Luke 9, 59 to 64, uh, 62, he gives us four invitation stipulations. First, you may have nowhere to live. If you follow Jesus, are you willing to be homeless? Are you willing to be homeless? Are we really serious about following Christ? Secondly, your family relationships must come last. In another place, he was talking about discipleship. He said, you've got to hate your father, your mother, your own life also to follow me. The third invitation stipulation is this. Your worldly concerns, all of your worldly concerns must be put behind you as you take up your cross and die daily. And I would say to you, if you're not willing, if you're not willing to have no place to sleep, to put your relationships behind you, to put your worldly concerns behind you, then you might, examine, you might want to examine whether or not you are a real disciple, follower of Jesus Christ, one who has really been born again. I don't know about that. Only you know about that. And the fourth stipulation is this. Jesus said unto them, No person, no person, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Whew. That's hard preaching, folks. 
That's hard. That's, that's, I would say, harder to preach than it is to hear because I am preaching myself under conviction. I'm asking myself these questions. And we've talked about Jesus issues his greatest invitation and the invitation to cross-bearing and the cross invitation stipulations, but there is also the invitation that's denied, the invitation that's denied. Jesus gives in Luke 14, 16 through 24, a parable about a man that, that gave a great banquet and then he sends his slaves out and tells all the ones who were invited to come that the time is ready. And they begin to make excuse. They begin to make excuse. The first excuse, I have bought a piece of ground and must go to see it. Now I've always kind of giggled. I've kind of giggled when I saw this and I think about it because who buys a piece of ground without going to see it first? The second excuse is, I have bought five yoke of oxen and must go to prove them. Now, I'm old school. When I buy a car, I want to go to the dealership. I want to drive the car. I want to kick the tires on it. I want to check the oil. I want to see how it runs, how it sounds, how it feels, and all that. That was back in my day. Now you can buy a car online and go to the vending machine and have it delivered. Right? You know what I'm talking about. But this fellow bought five yoke of oxen, five pair of oxen, and he, had to, he bought them before he saw them. That doesn't sound like that's logically solid in my mind. But the third excuse was, and you'll like this, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now don't be too hard on this fellow that wouldn't come to the man's banquet, okay? Because under the Hebrew Old Testament economy, if you got married, you were exempt for a year from military service. So he's kind of in that ballpark. So we've, we've talked about the invitation to come to Jesus. We've talked about the invitation of cross-bearing. And we've talked about the stipulations to the invitation. And we've talked about the invitation is denied. Now let's look at the most, one of the most intimate parts of the invitation. That is Jesus' invitation to abide in him. In John 15... 1 through 8, Jesus said that we are to make our abode in him. Now what's that? That's an old King James word, abode, abide. That's just where your home is. And here in Memphis parlance, we might say, where you stays at? Where's your home? What's your address? Where do you go? Where do you go when, when they have to take you in? That's my place. Up in the hill country of Middle Tennessee, we used to say, that's so-and-so's place. That's the old home place. That's the place. That's where you belong. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. You go, he called you to come to him, but after you come to him, you must abide in him. That means settle down. Make your life in him. Make your life in this book. Make your life on your knees. Make your life as our brother did. It's all about Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Make your life abide in him. Witness and pray and go to church and give your money and give yourself in service to the hospital or give yourself in, in, in service to the community, but die living and breathing in Jesus Christ, that's what his invitation is. That's who he is. That's what he wants us to do and be is come unto him. All you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And that rest is found in abiding in him. Nowhere else. There used to be a gospel song. The world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. I'd sing it for you, but you you would see why God called me to preach and not the music ministry. We've talked about the greatest invitation ever, ever issued. 
where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. We've talked about his invitation to cross bearing, and we've seen four invitation stipulations. And we've seen three ways that the invitation was denied. And we've talked about abiding or living our lives in Jesus because Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. You are nothing. You have nothing, but you can do nothing. And we've talked about the invitation to abide. Now let's close, if we can, with the Bible's final invitation. Revelation twenty-two seventeen. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him that is thirsty come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of the life freely. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the water of life. So, in a metaphorical sense, Jesus is saying, take the water of life. Come, whoever hears the word Come. The final word of the final book of the final chapter of the scripture is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. In homiletics class, preaching class in seminary, those preachers of us who are seminary trained, we were all taught, I know in some way or another, this, this question has always come. At the end of a sermon, the sermon has to answer the question, so what? You've given all, us all that, so what? It's a point of application. It's a point of application. Or what shall you do with what you've heard from me today? You've taken your time. You've come here. The hospital's bought our lunch. Praise the Lord for that. But what will you do with what you've heard? Let me leave you with a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Bonhoeffer was uh, executed by Adolf Hitler's regime just a few days before Hitler himself committed suicide. Listen to what Bonhoeffer says. When Christ calls, and I put in my notes here, or invites, when Christ invites a, a man or a person, he bids him to come and die. He bids him to come and die. My questions to you are of application. Will you take on Jesus' yoke? Will you take up your cross to follow Jesus? Will you come and die? Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Roger. Thank you all for being here today. As we, as we close out today, I just remind you that it really is the greatest invitation ever to come to Jesus, to die to self, and find life abundant and everlasting. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, the dichotomy of dying and living is sometimes difficult for us to, to understand. But Lord, we do know that you love us and you bid us to come to you so that we can unload all of our sinfulness Amen. and we can walk in purity of heart not only in today but in all the days that you give us all the way into and through eternity Amen. we praise you for this opportunity to stop and hear your word afresh and lord might we answer yes hear our praise in Jesus.
Thank you all for joining us today. God bless you.